While the UK faces years of austerity and public sector cuts, one of our European neighbours is looking forward to a far more prosperous future. Norway has been investing its oil wealth in its society's future since black gold first started pouring out of the North Sea in the 1970s. The fund is now so vast that it represents 1% of the value of all the world's stock markets. Douglas Fraser travelled to Norway to try to find out why they did something that maybe we should have done too. See any resemblance? A small northern European nation with a reputation for feistiness, fish, canny finance. In low-key Edinburgh and Oslo, they leave grandeur to royal palaces. While Holyrood's got its parliament, a rare Norwegian symbol of modern opulence, the Opera House. And, of course, they share the North Sea. More than 30 years ago, Norway and Scotland, or more accurately Britain, were handed a windfall, the opportunity to plunder their seabeds for oil and gas. That's where the story diverges. Britain spent the oil revenue as it came in. In Norway, they used it to pay off debt and then to save. It was here at the finance ministry in Oslo that they decided in the mid-1990s to stop spending the money they were making out of oil and gas in the North Sea and to start saving it. In under 20 years, the result is a fund of more than £300 billion. Population smaller than Scotland here, but that's 10 times Holyrood's annual budget. Well, it's a long story, but uh, the short version is that uh, when Norway first uh, struck oil in the late 60s and uh, the first revenues came into the uh, fiscal budget in the early 70s, uh, there was a very broad discussion in the parliament uh, uh, on the principles, of course. Uh, this, was, uh, this revenues was the property of the Norwegian people and they should be managed in a way also to benefit coming generations. We understood very, uh, very early that we couldn't use all that money inside Norway without destroying the whole economy. The second reason was uh, we had to share all that money with the future generation. So that was the main reason for establishing the fund. But after a while we saw the third reason, and that was because the pension cost for the government increased. Here's how it works. While Britain's oil revenues flow straight to the Treasury and become part of ordinary spending, in Norway they're piled into the Global Pension Fund. Parliaments approved a rule that no more than 4% of the value of the fund can be spent in any one year. That takes a bit of discipline. The populist party probably have gained some support on promising to or spend more money to solve uh, whatever uh, 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 issue, health, infrastructure, uh, but up to now, uh, at least, uh, the majority have sort of voted for politicians who, who favour that uh, way. It also works by investing elsewhere, not in Norway's small stock exchange, but by controlling roughly 1% of the world's stock markets. It requires Norway to look across the water to avoid overheating the home economy. Economists call it the resource curse. If you spend too much of uh, oil money or aid, for that, for that matter, in, uh, in the local economy, it will drive up prices. Lo uh, domestic demand will increase and then the, the, the currency will become stronger. You'll lose competitiveness and you will squeeze out industry and traded sector. You don't need someone with a Nobel economics prize to tell you Britain might have done better to save rather than spend, but here's one anyway. Oil is an asset below the ground. And what you do is you take that asset below the ground and you spend it. You're poor. It's like spending any other asset. You're living off your wealth, and if you live off your wealth, it's not sustainable. Across the North Sea in Scotland, this is seen as a nationalist message. If only Scotland had the opportunity to put its oil wealth aside, it could have the huge funds that Norway now has. But it's more than a nationalist message. There's a question of why the British state chose in the 70s and each year since then to spend the money rather than use it to underpin the welfare state. The failure to take that route brought us directly to today's debt, the fiscal crunch and radical reform that Britain's now going through. Britain's short-termism leaves Norwegians puzzled. I think that was a, uh, not, not a wise decision. I mean, we know that the, uh, it's a non-renewable resource, so it will eventually uh, run out. So uh, it's not an, an ordinary income. It's sort of building down the, 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 the country's wealth and we should manage it as a wealth and not as a sort of an income stream. 
So, what if Britain had saved? And here's another what if question. If you're saving money, you can't use the same money to spend, say, on public services. And that would have been a big challenge to Scotland if it did have all the access to oil and gas revenue from the North Sea. Take the 1980s. Would it have set up some kind of trust fund or might it have used all that money to subsidise the older and loss-making industries of steelmaking, coal mining, shipbuilding? If you look at the choices made by the Scottish Parliament in the past decade, it's hard to argue this is a country given to fiscal self-discipline. But in hearing from Norwegians what they think of their pension fund, there's another striking difference comes across. A contrast between Britain's and Scotland's short-termism and Norway's long view. This fund is a giant leap of faith in the next generation. It's a trust fund for the future. It's putting trust in those children and grandchildren. If you look at the political history of Norway, uh, there has always been, a, uh, uh, I would say, a very strong attitude that uh, the generations should work for each other's. Uh, in, in a long-term perspective. Uh, and uh, I think this is also part of the political culture in Norway, that uh, it's very important to uh, create values in order to spend money. It's very important that you uh, not look at one year, but many years. Uh, I've spent uh, a lot of time the last year uh, arguing for what I call a, a generational uh, uh, the get generational contract, that uh, it's important now that my generation uh, which has the uh, privilege of uh, both managing this, uh, uh, this money and also uh, the privilege of getting it, uh, should bear in mind that uh, the next generations would face uh, huge challenges in how to finance the welfare state and uh, uh, the oil, petrol, uh, the, the pension fund is one of the vital tools in uh, uh, handling that challenge. One country with a giant future fund, the other with a giant debt. This is about choices, about the constitution, mainly about our responsibility to the future. In Norway, they have a tradition of young people leaving to study, to see more of the world, in the expectation they'll come back. And with this legacy, you can see why they might want to. Douglas Fraser there. Well, I'm joined now by Robert Wright, who's the Professor of Economics at Strathclyde University and who specialises in demographics. Thanks for coming in, uh, Professor. The Norwegian economists and commentators in the package were astonished that when all this money was flowing in the, into the Treasury, that successive Westminster governments spent it rather than saved it. What was going on in Norway that wasn't going on in the UK at that time? I, mean, I think the key thing to remember is the Norwegian economy, or sorry, population is very small. It's less than 5 million. It's actually 300,000 less than the Scottish population, where the population in the United Kingdom is 62 million. Yet we had similar revenues coming in, but more demand on expenditure in the United Kingdom than in Norway. I mean, it was almost impossible for Norway you know, to spend the amount of money that was coming in. And that proved to be relatively easy in the United Kingdom, for example, paying for the high levels of unemployment in the Thatcher era, investing in the infrastructure of the country, and also rolling out the welfare state. I mean, so we spent this rather than saved it. The Norwegians had the opportunity to save it because mainly because of the scale. But was there not some way leeway to at least save some? Well, I mean, I'm sure that um, you can say you, they could have saved some, but how much? I mean, the thing is, I mean, we, we don't want to exaggerate how much money we're talking about here when we divide it through by, the, say, the population of the United Kingdom. I mean, per head, it's, it's a relatively small amount compared to the per head amount in, in Norway. And the, the Although it has to be said, this fund has built up mm. to this massive... Yeah, I mean, of money. it's massive, but also a, a country like Norway knows that this oil will run out eventually, and they are equally worried about their future. Now, their economy, because of this oil, in my view, has not diversified enough. Effectively, what they have is the oil sector, petroleum sector, fishing, bit of aluminum smelting, and that's it. The industrial sector is very small, manufacturing is very small, it's very uncompetitive, okay, it's, it's very protected by the government. So again, where is the wealth of Norway going to come in the future when, you know, when this money runs out? It will run out some, some, some time down the road. And it will be a long time down, down the road, but it will run out. And this is a concern. Let me ask you though about what came out of the film as well, about this obligation that they seem to have to future generations, this cultural idea. 
that's not in our culture, it would seem, with our politicians. <laughs> no, not at the moment. I mean, the, the, you know, the, the pro so essentially what we have been doing in almost all higher, high income countries is that we're, we've been mortgaging the future. So the expectation is that future generations are going to pay for a chunk of the consumption that we're enjoying now. And we, you know, we're seeing this kind of break with this mentality in the United Kingdom with uh, in the recent events where the expectation is that we, we're going to have to pay back this massive debt now over the next few years rather than, you know, place that debt on our children and grandchildren. Indeed, I mean, I'm not, it's not clear to me that our uh, Norwegians are any more intergenerationally savvy than people in the United Kingdom are. It's just that they have a little bit more flexibility because they have this pot of money and they know it's going to last at least one more generation anyway. But it seems to they're able to hold the line on only spending 4% of this. There is some pressure for more to be spent on infrastructure, hospitals, education, but that doesn't seem to have popular support. So why are they able to hold the line as well on how much of it they spend well, year to year? Also, I mean, many of the discussions that we're having in the United Kingdom and have been having in the United Kingdom for the last decade, I mean, they're also having them in Norway. I mean, it has a very large debt, if you like, public uh, service debt, about 60% of GDP. So, I mean, it's not like a country that's, you know, the government has not had to borrow a lot of money to finance the welfare state. It has extremely high levels of taxation and has you know, a wide range of universal welfare benefits. And there's a discussion, uh, similar to what we have here, whether or not they can afford you know, to pay this out in, in, into the future indefinitely, even with this big pot of money that they've accumulated because of this uh, freebie of oil in the North Sea. But it must be that they have a cushion that we do not have. Well, I mean, the thing is that they certainly have a cushion. It's just a matter of how long that cushion will last. Our cushion is definitely going to... Uh, be you know much shorter than theirs, but in the end there will be no oil left in the North Sea either for the United Kingdom or Norway, uh, and uh, you know we'll have to see what the situation is then. And I think I think it, I would just like to stress I think that you know oil is both a blessing and a curse. We have the discussion that we had in your your film clip, your film, and yet again it has stopped the Norwegian economy from diversifying, right? and they're worried about you know what their future is going to be like in the same way that we are. And finally, very briefly, is it too late? Even if we well, I mean, changed our tack now. I, I mean, it's, 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 it's never too late. I mean, we, you know, almost, it almost goes by weekly. There's, you know, reanalysis of how much oil is left in, in the North Sea. You know, we know, we know there's, the technology is not quite there, obviously, for the deep, the deep well drilling, etc. But, um, yes, I, I, you know, I do think, I mean, the government, you know, is, is impressed upon us as consumers and as individuals, as, as parents to save, and I think that they should also save themselves. And, uh, again, this, there, there's other, other places around the world, for example, the, the province of Alberta in Canada has a heritage fund where they have, it's worth about nine billion pounds at the moment. And, you know, they have been saving this okay. uh, since the 70s. We have to leave it there, Professor. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much indeed.